Hello and welcome to our webinar, Better Sports Nutrition Simplified, because better nutrition enables better performance. We are thrilled to have Amanda Carlson Phillips joining us today. Amanda is the Vice President of Nutrition and Research at Exos. She is a leader on the Exos Performance Innovation Team and is committed to helping all Exos clientele achieve their performance potential through mindset, nutrition, movement and recovery. Amanda also coordinates the company's performance research team, undertaking both case studies and peer-reviewed research to help Exos stay on the cutting edge of both health and performance. We'll have a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so if you want to uh, type in any questions into the uh, chat box, feel free, and if we have time, I'll read them out at the end. Also, if you want to view this webinar um, afterwards, it will be up on Ashley's uh, YouTube page or on her Facebook page within the next 48 hours or so. So feel free to check it out there. Okay, um, let's get started. Ashley, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, this is going to be awesome. I am so excited about it. And gosh, you know, a lot of times as I'm putting together slides or having conversations with an expert, it's like, let, there are a lot of things that um, you know we're, we're trying to sort out and, and figure out how to prioritize what to talk about. And I think in this one, it was just so crystal clear because I get so many questions all the time about either conflicting information in the sports and performance space, and um, as well as uh, information about really optimizing results and not thinking about. Uh, that optimization in the short term. You're really thinking about it, whether it's for the, you know your year, your several years, your lifetime, all of those pieces. So when I started to think about this, it was an absolute no-brainer to turn to the folks at Exos. I was really lucky to uh, be introduced to Exos um, kind of with a one-two punch. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Stephanie Carter in DC, um, her uh, company works with them, and uh, she introduced me to the company, and then I started to notice that at a couple of different conferences I was at, Mark Verstegen, the founder, was speaking, and then I also noticed that a couple of articles that I was reading were, had mentions of them, and then in addition, I had one or two clients um, who were like, oh yeah, I've totally, you know, that's their thing. Um, I've you know been involved. They're the real deal. This is who you would go to. Just such strong support, and that really does sum up Exos. It is the the real deal. So what you are getting today, um, and if you follow my uh, takeout uh, podcast, you may have um, already heard from Mark Verstegen. But what you're going to get here is the nuts and bolts, and nobody better to do that than Amanda Carlson Phillips. Um, I will introduce her once I uh, jump in a little bit further um, with uh, some of the introductions here and, and a lay of the land of what we're going to do, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. So uh, today, um, and always, I am so grateful for my partners who allow me to bring uh, better information, better nutrition, better results uh, to all of you, and they are very much a part of the conversation today. Um, recently, I was posting on Instagram a shot of uh, I'd been pumping some iron in the weight room, and then I said, "All right, I'm downstairs pumping some iron uh, in the kitchen." And you know, I think it's really important for us to understand plant-based quality sources of iron, and that's just one of the benefits of hemp seeds, uh, and as well as look when we look at the fat profile and the protein profile. Um, what that offers for you, uh, not just for during your performance, so you get a good workout, but also, or a good uh, performance, but also afterwards uh, to help the body recover. And if I'm ever talking about recovery, and pretty often I would say, or just in general, when I am talking, I am usually speaking about magnesium and the power of magnesium uh, to really help turn off stress inside the cells. Uh, we love to flex our muscles, but we our muscles are made to be flexed and then they're made, meant to be relaxed. And uh, magnesium uh, is such a key part of that. And in particular, you guys know that Calm is my uh, calm is my guru. <laughs> Whether it's on the magnesium citrate powder that I take at night, or when I travel, um, or post workout, or a, a magnesium citrate bath, which I actually first discovered with um, working with some of my uh, musician clients after being on stage, and that was quite a performance they were putting in. Um, really, the power of magnesium to help them relax. So. Uh, definitely natural vitality factors in much here. 
true Brock we may not be thinking about when we think about um, workouts, performance, sports nutrition. Uh, we may not be thinking about broccoli, although we should. Uh, I love my broccoli for so many different reasons, a lot of the nutrients I talked about. But when I'm talking about true Brock, I'm actually talking about detoxification. And one of the things that we have to understand is that uh, physical performance is so fantastic for us, um, but it can also um, very intentionally produce waste products, and those waste products need to be eliminated. Um, but also, one of the things that is a um, preventative to optimal performance is if our body is not detoxifying uh, appropriately, and that also includes elimination appropriately. Um, True Brock is a glucoraphanin, and glucoraphanin is an enabler of sulforaphane in the body, and that sulfur upregulates phase two detoxification. I'm not going to go into any more than that, other than to say that you can eat your broccoli, or you can look for supplements that have True Brock, which I'll show you at the end as well well as uh, teas and coffees. So the final one, nature's path. On my path, I try to do as much of this organic as possible because I really honestly, you know, I subscribe to a platform of better, not perfect, and that's what I think organic is. And I also want my food to be delicious. I always say better nutrition better be delicious. And uh, Nature's Path delivers both of those uh, across um, all their different products. So really grateful to always have them on board. Um, okay, what are we going to do today? So today, um, and what a great time to be doing this because my calves just kicked it off and we've got the uh, the Indians and the Cubs and there's so much, you know, sports is definitely on the mind. So um, this is going to be really fun. We all, we want to talk about what we all want um, out of our sports, out of our performance, out of our lives. And as a result, what do we all need? And then we're going to jump in and talk to Amanda about how we get it. Um, and at the very end, we've got some resources for you. And as Matt mentioned, we've got the Q&A. So without further ado, just a quick reminder, we all want better health. We do not all want broccoli. We do not all want to drink activated charcoal or do sit-ups or run sprints or do stairs. We might want those at different moments, but we do want to get and keep better health. But the problem today, I use the phrase infobesity. We are just drowning in information. So even it's very hard for the good quality information to break through. And that excess of information like excess of anything can weigh us down and really make it irritating on the body and on the mind and hard for us to get optimal results. So my whole goal with these webinars is to break through and stop that infobesity and help you get the nuggets of information but also really to talk about how we can transform. So how do we take that information and transform that into actions uh, that you can uh, put into your real daily lives. So better new sports nutrition, it enables better performance, which is about better sports longevity. Some of you guys might have heard my interview with, uh, my podcast interview with Patrick Manley. Um, also Derek Jeter has talked quite a bit about this. A lot of the athletes talk about the fact that they wish they had better nutrition early on, earlier on in their lives, but when they were at pivotal points that in learning about and discovering better nutrition was really key for their sports performance, the longevity, um, as well as a better quality of life and overall better health because um, it always isn't about our sports, uh, our performance, and why I love the tagline every day is game day is that uh, you're all, every day you want to step up and have that better day. Um, so better nutrition, as we've talked about before, is about what goes in and on you. We want to talk about what will actually enable your better health and what are the things that deduct from your health. And remember, this isn't perfect nutrition. It's better, not perfect. So what we're really talking about here is how can we do less of the deductos and more of the enablers, and that's the game plan for today. Uh, of course, you can always access my nutrition plan, um, and we may reference that as we go further. And now... This is the fun part. So today we have with us Amanda. Um, gosh, I geeked out and had such a great conversation the first time I talked to her. I was like, we're going to have to do this like on a weekly basis. And one of these days I'm going to get out there uh, to actually hang out with you um, at one of the different centers or projects that Exos is working on. Um, but Amanda, I would love to, so first of all, by way of introduction, I always like to ask people if they were a food, what food would you be? And then, and maybe a little why, and then we can jump into who you are and what you're doing at Exos. Oh my gosh, that is a, a great question. Well, uh, as I ponder which food I would be, um, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. I totally agree. 
Um, you know, we had such a great conversation uh, the first time, and it's always so fun to, to talk with people that are, are passionate about food and, and passionate about nutrition and, and starting to share that knowledge. So thank you so much for, for having me on. Um, I'm just going to go with, with what I feel and what has come to, to my mind first. Um, if I would be any type of food, I, I'd be popcorn. Um, so, you know, one, because I love popcorn, but also um, because it, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit wild, and um, it is something that's so delicious, and uh, it's something that sticks with you, and uh, it's associated with lots of, of great memories for me. So I guess uh, I'm a little bit of popcorn today. I love it. I've never heard that one, so and I absolutely love it. So that is super fun, and I can't wait to get this. I think we'll see a little bit of the wild as we go through this, so that'll be fun. So tell us a little bit. We're seeing some photos here. Tell us a little bit about you, and then let's dive into what brought you to Exos and what you're doing there. Sure. So um, I have always been had a passion for sport. I was I was a gymnast growing up and, um, and and really just loved all types of sports. But, you know, when I went to college, I went to University of Arizona and I really fell in love with, uh, with the science of nutrition. I actually went there to uh, be a sports psychologist and there is a huge link between psychology and nutrition, but I just fell in love with the science. And while I was there at University of Arizona, um, I was really trying to figure out how I could blend my passion for sport with nutrition. Sports nutrition really didn't exist um, at that point in time uh, in a practical and ap applied standpoint in 2001. So um, I was really lucky. I had a great TA there at University of Arizona who had done some work at Florida State. So I found myself in Tallahassee, Florida uh, getting my graduate degree in uh, one of the first sports slash clinical nutrition programs in the country that happened to blend in all the requirements to become a registered dietitian uh, and have the exercise physiology department interwoven with the nutrition, which again was was pretty revolutionary back then. It's 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 much more standard now to combine uh, exercise phys and nutrition. But while I was there in Tallahassee, I, I ended up staying a little longer and got another master's degree in exercise physiology because uh, we move and. To move, we have to have fuel, and the right fuel to do that um, for the right type of occasion. So uh, I was a perfect blend, and uh, I was a bit serendipitous, but I had to, uh, to to finish up my exercise physiology degree, uh, that master's degree, uh, with a thesis or a non-thesis. And I I took the non-thesis option, and I found myself at Athletes Performance in Tempe, Arizona doing a strength and conditioning internship to round out my exercise physiology's masters. And so at that time, Mark Verstegen, um, the owner of Athletes Performance, which is now Exos, uh, the owner of Exos, the founder, and, um, and my boss, you know, we, in the midst of all of that, you know, he has a, a clear direction around the, the four pillars of performance, which I'm sure he talked about with you, mindset, nutrition, movement, recovery. And um, in the midst of that internship, I, I came on to to you know, continue to evolve the nutrition program. So that was 13 years ago. We had one site. Uh, we trained professional athletes in that integrated model with strength coaches, dietitians, athletic trainers, and you know, did everything we could to, to enhance performance. So here I am sitting as vice president of nutrition and research, still an avid um, athlete as much as I can. I love mountain biking. I'm a mom and uh, to a five-year-old, so which probably makes me feel uh, even more like popcorn sometimes, but I'm um, still trying to, you know, continue to, to spread the word about nutrition and simplify nutrition as you say it so so perfectly and, and get people excited about things they can do right now with the way that they move and the way that they eat and the way that they think um, that can dramatically impact the way that they feel. So that's what that's what that's my path. That's so awesome. And so tell us, so athletes performance became Exos and tell us now, um, I'm always curious when, and Mark talked a little bit about every day is game day, but what does that mean to you? Well, I think, you know, the, the story about athletes' performance to Exos starts to bring that to life. So, you know, when, when Mark first started and, and I joined, we were about training the professional athlete, but we started to get, um, we started to get questions and we started to get people who, who wanted to um, train like an athlete or be supported like an athlete. And, you know, we really thought, well, why not? Why, 
why shouldn't everybody have access to great systems, to great methodology, uh, to great training, um, to great information to help them be at the best of their game? So then we developed uh, the brand core performance. So we had athletes performance that was focused on the athlete, then we had core performance that was focused on you know the rest of us that have to to play in the game of life every single day. And you know, building two brands is challenging, so we merge those brands, and and here it is, Exos, and Exos is is pioneering human performance, helping individuals of all walks of life um, have and be supported uh, with the tools that an athlete has to help them be at the best of their game each and every day when there is no off season. So that is really you know the evolution of every day is game day. Yeah, and I love it. Um, I, I don't want to give it away, but one of the questions that came into me was, and I think it's probably something we often, the person that we probably interact with, and it was somebody, he was just very blunt, but he was talking about, you know, he used to be an athlete, and uh, he's very clear, I'll, I'll save it for our Q&A, but he's very clear that he's not an athlete today, um, but he still has the passion to, so for him, what he's looking for is that support, and as you talked about, that passion to get himself back to that space, um, but doesn't really know where to start. And I think a lot of the questions that we answer today will um, get us there. Um, but it was interesting to me that that was the response. He wasn't familiar with Exos, and when he saw this, that was the response that he got. So I, I think you're hitting on it. And we just included in here Mark's slide um, saying we're here to upgrade lives. I think that's going to be so much of the communication today. So I'm excited. Um, you included in here. Uh, this is a little. I think it's a video. Um, we will hold the video. Will be in the slides that people can get, and we'll go ahead and um, just to and for the sake of time today, we'll go ahead and. Uh, play that um, when we run it live um, or on the webinar, they'll be able to play it. Um, but I wanted to move over here to really understanding the years of high performance um, because we're not, you know, we're, we're not back in the Stone Age, <laughs> despite what some people might choose to be eating or calling their eating habits, right? So let's talk a little bit about what this slide represents in terms of increasing years of high performance. For sure. So, you know, we really came up with this model. Um, when we were working with the, the professional athlete. And if you think about the football player, the professional football player, depending upon what stat you read, but they typically have about a 2.3 to 2.7 year window to be in the NFL. So what can we do for that professional athlete to help them maintain that physical function, um, as you had talked about it, you know, in the recovery of, of the body and the cell, but how do we help them um, maintain that physical function uh, to really help take advantage of the technical and tactical skill that they continue to get over time. So, um, you know, that is our that is our goal with the athlete is helping to extend that career window by improving strategies across mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery to improve career longevity, decrease injury potential, and improve that career productivity. So, you know, that is the perspective for the athlete. But wow, if you just look at the rest of us in the game of life, we're trying to do the same thing. And although our our goals might be different and our markers of performance might be different, you know, whether that's um, how we are at our job, the energy that we have with our families, um, the ability to to reach certain goals um, from you know maybe a sport or a, an athletic endeavor, the goals change, but the core fundamentals are the same. Is how can we maintain our, our physical environment of our body as our ability to learn, our technical, our tactical skills, our experiences continue to increase over time. So it is really about getting the most um, out of the experience that we have. Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. And one of the reasons you guys um, were so, uh, it was just such a love affair at the get-go is the um, so many people are, are following plans or being presented with plans or recommendations today uh, that just jump in and are based on where what has worked for someone else, either the person who's advising them or maybe what the, the research or the studies say. And where you guys start from, uh, and I loved the recent Outside Magazine article that really detailed this, uh, one individual's uh, specific experience. But is so I have my AKA, and while on the food and evaluation side, that's actually cough approved. But I use it to to stand for assess, 
keep and act, act differently. And the assessment part, what you guys do from an assessment part is really get to who someone is right now. And that's going to be, you know, then you figure out, okay, what do we keep doing that you're doing well and build on that. But then also what are the new things we have to do or what are the things that we have to, you know, have you do differently. And so as we go into the next phase of this, um, uh, wanting to move through uh, the pillars of performance and then into some of the questions. I wanted to think a and, and talk a little bit about specifically how how you guys go about you know taking whether it's one individual um, or whether it's a group of individuals that you're being you know um, you're coming into an Intel or a Google or the Army um, and how do you start you know where where's your entry point? So it's a, it's a it's a great it's a great place to start um, it, because assessment is so important and oftentimes people are looking so far forward into the goal that they're trying to achieve that that oftentimes they're they're not taking the first critical steps that they need uh, to really get themselves going on the path to success. So um, you know we look at things uh, you know clearly across these four pillars of performance and. Um, the thing about having this multi-dimensional methodology, one, when it's all when it's running on all cylinders, it's not just symbiotic; it's synergistic, and we see people, you know, achieve goals much faster. But it also, you know, presents a little bit of complexity around how you you put a plan together for someone because someone may be really far advanced um, in their in their movement strategies, but their mindset and their coping is so um, is, is so is in great need of help. So um, I would say you know, we're looking at um, these four pillars. We have what we call our performance quotient. So we are meeting people where they are um, through assessment of their general um, ability to uh, cope, um, evolve behaviors, uh, even into some of the neuropsychology components for mindset. We're looking at behaviors and nutrient status um, and different types of other biochemical components when we have it from a nutrition standpoint. Um, movement, we're looking at assessments and movement from not just how fit are you, but what is the quality of your movement. And um, by improving mobility and stability, we're able to really create a better foundation to support that enhanced uh, physical fitness that you'll gain through additional movement. And then lastly, you know, how do we how do we look at recovery and you know your 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 thoughts around magnesium and, and sleep and, and cellular protection are so important. So many, so many of us are looking at what do I do, what more do I do, and, and maybe we need to think about those times when we don't do. So assessing how someone's sleeping, assessing um, hormonal status throughout the day, uh, different components to really understand how is that person recovering. So as people are thinking, well, how do I put all this together? It's taking a step back and and thinking about where you are behaviorally and um, you know from an outcome standpoint across these four pillars as you put a plan together. Yeah, I love it. I, I just always I think if you're if you're going to someone for help and they don't actually ask who you are right now or go to a certain degree of figuring it out, I think you know that's to me that's like the greatest flag. Um, it also helps us sort through the type of information we take in because if it's not targeted on some level to you then it is just information and it's it's unlikely to be transformation uh, enabling but I also I, you know from this I like to say to people specific to my nutrition plan I have the four pillars there as well so maybe there's something to four pillars I'm also like you know in years of doing this you're like me you know we're like two decades into this I've never met somebody who is a total health hot mess like they're not doing everything wrong and so I think part of it is you know being able to use the pillars and the assessment to say like, hey, you know, there's some stuff you're doing right. Let's keep that, you know, and then let's mo let's move on, you know, from there. So I I, I really appreciate that um, energy and commitment to looking at the different areas, um, you know, and honoring where somebody is really advanced, you know, and, and has done some work. So all right, I had so many questions for you. Uh, this is so great for me because I get to ask mine first. Um, I think some of these are going to be overlapping, but I try to break them up into groups. So in this, this is sort of in that assessment, evaluation, goal setting phase. Uh, we just talked a little bit about how do you assess where someone is today, their nutritional needs. Um, but on that end, so specific now to you as the dietitian. So somebody's coming over to you. Uh, as the dietitian, and maybe across a couple of those areas, you know, not just the nutrition, but about the recovery, et cetera. Um, what are some of the tools that you uh, rely on the most or that you think are the most insightful for you? 
Yeah. Well, I think the most important tool is the, the relationship that you build with the expert. So as people are coming in, um, you know, the more I know about you, um, the real you, and, and, you know, how you're feeling and, and what you've been doing and what your goals are, and even more so what you're willing to commit to, honestly, you know, that's how I can, and anyone, I think any registered dietitian can really help you. So I think the most important tool is the relationship that you build with that expert. Now, you know, from a dietitian standpoint and, and from like a, you know, a subject matter expert standpoint, for me, the more, the more information I know about you, the more targeted I can create a program for you. So um, that relates to how you live throughout your day and your different types of behaviors, um, your environment that you're in, uh, the schedules that you keep, um, the barriers that you see. So you have those very uh, psychological and behavioral components. But then I think you know the real force multiplier are, are some of these these other metrics. So um, you know if I can quantify how you're sleeping and I can see that and I can um, quantify what your nutrient status is through through blood work and I can understand what your food intolerances are that are measured, not just reported. It just creates more clarity. I almost think about it. You know if you if you had to go to the eye doctor and they're trying to figure out which which prescription of contacts or glasses is going to be right for you? It's like number one or number two. And then they, they move into kind of the next level of that prescription. So, you know, the more information that we know about your body's current nutrient status, how it responds to certain types of foods, and, you know, genetically what you were predispositioned to, the, the more clear of a path we can, we can create. Yeah, and, and um, I totally support that, and I think that, that um, the way you summed it up as the tool, uh, the, mo the most important tool and really coming down from that is, is fantastic. I might lead the witness a little bit here on asking this next question, you know, environment or genetics. I get asked all the time now, you know, as a dietitian, am I so excited about the era of, you know, nutrigenomics and, and really genetic assessments, and um, I... I'm, my enthusiasm is muted for one core reason, and that is that even without being able um, historically for the last century to delve into people's DNA and look at it, uh, we are very clear that environment uh, has the ability to trump your genetic, uh, most of your genetics. And so I think it's exciting about some of the genetic, uh, you know, some of the, the, the um, tools that we're getting and some of the understanding that we'll have uh, in the future, I think it needs to be better. But I'm curious if you're if, if, in a different way or if you guys are doing certain things at the genetic level that you feel like, wow, this is totally game changer. Well, I think, you know, I, I agree, and it's not leading the witness. We've been following the genetic realm for probably about five years now, and I would have to say that, you know, to your to your first kind of slides and your first talking points around so much information. Now this is just so much more information. And so do I think that it is ready for like a direct to consumer or someone without, you know, a very good foundational background trying to figure out what this means for them? It's not there yet. But is it another tool for experts to use to help kind of put those pieces together? I definitely think that that's coming. So um, I, I think, you know, which one is, which one plays a bigger role? I think the genetic piece is kind of, you know, what are you predispositioned to, um, and the science can give us clues to how our bodies, you know, may function or, you know, gives us clues to how our body, um, you know, may process something. But then ultimately, it's up to us and, and how we optimize that with the choices that we make. So I think about it as, you know, how much information can we get to understand our operating system? But then if you decide not to run, you know, the right software on that operating system, um, thinking of, you know, software being the choices that we end up making, then, then, it all, then, then it all is not, you know, reaching its highest potential. So I think both play a key role, you know, understanding your body, improving your environment, and, um, you know, the science is not a mandate. It's simply another piece to help us fine tune um, and the recommendations that hopefully motivate uh, to, to create some better choices for yourself. Great. 
So this next question is a totally unfair question for any RD to offer to any other RD to present. If I ask, you know, how, do, how long does it take to see results? On the one hand, you know, I, I see people um, in my office or, you know, if you're giving a talk where as soon as you explain how their body works, you see a noticeable shift and a reduction of stress or even if you take them through a breathing exercise. And so my feeling is that's noticeable results. But um, I guess if I'm a little bit more targeted or specific in this question, uh, because this was one that came in and was not one that, that I generated, I, you know, I think what the question really here is, is if somebody comes to see you and starts on a program, in terms of managing their expectations, how do you lay out a, a pathway to um, the types of and the degree of, of results that you're going to see? Yes, yeah, so very interesting question. So when I when I looked at this you know question and thought about it for a little bit, you know I go back to you know what are the results that people are are expecting and what are the results that you know that they um, are talking about. So when I think about you know great nutrition as it relates to sports and performance, I really think of it in kind of two elements. You have kind of this foundational sense of nutrition that is is not as immediately, um, I guess, uh, feeling. You, can, you can't really feel the foundational aspects of nutrition. I'll explain that a little bit more um, immediately. But you might be able to really feel that acute nature of your pre, during, and your post um, type of strategies from a nutritional standpoint. So I think we've all felt it when we go into a high intensity session under fueled. You cannot perform at the highest level. So. Um, you can feel that. So if you have suboptimal um, kind of fueling strategies before your session, you will feel that as it relates to performance um, during that session. The same thing for your kind of during strategy. So if you have a 30-minute yoga session, uh, there's not a lot there that's going to impact performance. But if you're going out for um, a 90-minute mountain bike ride and you haven't thought about your hydration strategy, you're going to feel it out on the bike. So um, there's definitely some elements based on duration and intensity where you can immediately feel the, the results of having the right fluid, the right electrolytes, and the right fuel for that type of session. Lastly is around post and that kind of post exercise period and this is something that that you won't necessarily feel immediately unless you're incorporating you know certain types of foods like you know cherry juice or dried cherries that you know may help with a little bit of soreness but what happens in the post is if you can really nail that post workout nutrition and the research is really showing us you know around the protein consumption post workout you help with the adaptation so you're going to go put all this work in and then getting the right type of fuel, um, the right type of nutrition after helps to promote that adaptation, which means your body recovers faster, which means you reach your goals faster. So I think, you know, this question absolutely is a, is a multifaceted one, um, but I would think about it just, you know, to, to sum it up in two points. You know, foundationally, you want to be doing the right things most of the time, getting the body into the best physiological uh, form it can to support movement and activity. And then when you think about your movement and activity, this is where you can get acute results in how you feel and how you can perform as it relates to pre and during, and then really getting on point with your post to maximize adaptations for that session and make you better the next time. Yeah, I love that. Um, you did an amazing job there. And it actually reminds me of something that tags to the second question, which is the idea of, you know, the tool is really getting to know your the dietitian and the patient really getting to know each other. And part of that is the patient being super clear about how you define results. And so if your results is very is hyper performance related, it's sharing that part. But if your results are also include, you know, I feel I tend to feel bloated or um, I get migraines or, you know, I, I have trouble sleeping or these sorts of things, that's, you know, you have to be very clear about your results. So, that, so there is a role for the individual uh, coming forward to define and have clarity about their desired results. All right. So let's move to game day. Um, so I think it's so interesting when we think about this every day is game day. Uh, you know, the we've talked about what. Uh, a, a bit of an overview of what better sports nutrition is and, and the concept of whether you're a pro athlete or you're in the military, you're an executive, a stay-at-home parent, um, or whatever you're doing, um, you're going to have your game days. And I'm curious if there's 
what better sports nutrition looks like specific to uh, game day, um, which is a little bit, um, it's almost not a fair question in a way because we just said every day is game day. But, you know, a lot of people will say to me on a, on a day that they're, they're really hyper-focused on their performance, do you have some tips specific to that? Yeah, I have I have a few tips, and then I, I have some perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the perspective, and then we can think about just like in a, in acute period. But you know, when when we think about the qualities of you know great nutrition, and you know what does nutrition look like on game day, you know you're at the top of your game when your body is nourished, when your body is prepared, and when your body is recovered. So those three things don't happen immediately. Those are results of you know the small, simple things done savagely well over time. So as you're gearing up for that that game day performance, um, really making sure that you know the history is and, and what you're doing from a nutritional standpoint is nourishing, preparing, and recovering your body on a daily basis. The next piece of that, like when you know your behaviors are super top notch, is um, when you're inspired by what you're doing and it is like, you know, your nutritional components of that are really your, your normal. So whether, you know, you have your kind of um, snacks in, in your purse or your snacks in your briefcase that you're traveling with a, with a water bottle that, um, you know, I, I'm traveling right now. I'm up in San Francisco. I've got my, you know, aminos in my bag. I, I've made sure that I have the right types of snacks. You know, I'm inspired and engaged in in my action plan as it relates to nutrition. So, um, someone who is who is gearing up and and really taking um, attention to detail to all things is going to have that that type of environment around them. So, it truly is you know when your environment matches your intentions. Um, so, if I was to think about you know a few things to that are really important um, for performing. One, every, everybody is different. So if I think about, you know, you have to give a great presentation or, you know, you're standing up at a, at a PTO meeting and leading, leading a, a group of, of parents that are helping to support the school, whatever it is, um, there are certain components that, that, that are true. And that a hydrated brain is a more functioning brain. So making sure, you know, that you are, you're hydrated is going to impact the way you feel and the way that you perform. Um, if you have to perform day in and day out, you know, having the nutrients available to support your energy needs is also really important. If you are driving on adrenaline and not really keeping hormones in check um, with the frequent combination of, of eating, you're, you're going to put yourself in at a deficit um, to make the recovery uh, from that deficit more intense. So um, if I had to pick two things that were super important to, to performing and being on point, like right now, hydration and, um, and your kind of nutrient and meal timing uh, leading up to that, that big event is, is going to have an impact on the way you perform and, and how difficult it's going to be to recover from that performance. That's great and a perfect segue to, um, I was laughing when I actually started looking at questions. So a bunch of the questions were about how much protein do we need, but it was all sort of, I, maybe I took from it that people were just all feeling like they need more protein or, you know, understanding that part. And I think it's interesting also the whole protein versus aminos conversation. So um, I'd love to start there and, and to talk about protein, to talk about fat, talk about water and, and hydration as you as we were just uh, as you just mentioned it was interesting to me that throughout this entire you know we, we've had people sending in questions for about a month nobody asked about carbs and I think it's so interesting because I feel like people either just don't want to think about or don't want to focus on carbs and, and obviously they they play such a key role so even though they're not included in one of the questions here I'd love I'd love to have you sort of tackle the question from a nutrient balance standpoint of like, why do I need my carbs? Why do I need my protein? Why do I need my fats? And how do I make that happen? And maybe also know what I need within, you know, the context of those nutrients. Sure. Um, so I just can kind of run through protein. Yeah, protein is a, it's an important one. And, uh, you know, do people need more protein? It's always hard for me to make, you know, blanket statements. But um, I think that, that people sometimes have a challenge consistently meeting their protein needs. So we recommend that you know, people get anywhere from about 0.6 to 1 gram of protein per pound per day, 1 gram being you know, the top level. There's really no need um, to go over that. 
And so, you know, that's the range of protein that, that we recommend. If you're more active, if you have more stress, if there's more breakdown going on, you kind of go to that upper level. Um, if there's kind of less movement, less stress, you're kind of at, at that lower level. So again, that's you know based on, on the evidence, but somewhere between 0 0.6 to about one gram per pound per day is, is how much protein we recommend. And you know there's there's research around well how much should be how much should we have at one time, and and how much can you really absorb? And and uh, the research continues to evolve and change. But when we think about protein and the function of protein. It is to help rebuild and recover the body and the cells. So there's a very specific amino acid called leucine. And leucine is like this little amino acid you can imagine like flying through a room and turning on the light switch. And so he's kind of flying through your body and turning on the switch in the cell to help that cell start to recover. So I think, you know, the message moving forward is less around total protein and really around leucine content of that protein. And that's where you get into um, the value and, and the, um, the impact the protein will have. And that, that level of leucine that is um, you know, being touted in the research right now is anywhere between like, you know, 2.3 uh, to about 3 grams um, or so is that, that, that trigger point to, to when he flies and turns on the, the light switch in the cell. So, you know, those are my, my thoughts on protein around around how much and, and kind of thinking about this, this new theory uh, of leucine versus just um, type. Um, so fats, I think the fats, you can kind of go on to that and then I'll pause. Um, but I, I, you know, I like this kind of this shift of, uh, you know, proteins and fats in the forefront and, you know, carbohydrates that are kind of supporting the engine. So, um, you know, we need carbohydrates. Uh, in some way, shape, or form to, to fuel the body. And it depends on kind of what research and, and camps you're looking at. Um, and and there's, there's benefits of, of different levels of carbohydrates for different types of conditions. So uh, there is not a one-size-fits-all, but your body needs to have fuel. Um, and, you know, a good majority of, of that can come from glucose. But um, coming to the forefront are, you know, getting enough protein and then getting enough fat. I mean, the, the research coming out now on, um, you know, the, the saturated fat uh, statements and, and you know, our, our fear of fat for so long is hopefully changing the way people focus on fats. And we should be focusing on the power that they have. And we've always recommended about 30% of the diet coming from, from those fats and, and not just any fats, but a variety of fats because that variety gives different types of nutrients. So focusing on ones that are high in omega-3, focusing on ones like coconut that are high in medium chain triglycerides, uh, focusing on others that are your more mono and poly, your avocados and other types of nuts. They all provide different stuff. But this should be the end of the fear on fats and should be a focus on finding fats that are fantastic. Awesome. I love that. Fantastic fats. I see an ad campaign coming through. So I very much like that. So let's talk about hydration. You know, I was actually just, um, there were a couple of pieces or stories, I think, coming through. I can't remember. Maybe I was on a tarmac for too long on Twitter. Um, but just about the idea of too much water. And I think that that, that really is something that has been of a concern to people um, in their, uh, you know, especially not as much with training, but, uh, you know, during performance time. But I think part of it is there is a lack of understanding of what, what I'll call true hydration, you know, really how the electrolytes work. So um, I think rather than just focusing on what are the rules with water, what are the hydration rules, the things you were just talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I like the way you framed it up. And, and Hydration is is always talked about, and oftentimes it's it's a great place for people to start when they're upgrading nutritional habits because we have to drink throughout the day. So um, I think first and foremost, you just want to maintain, you know, a good hydration status in general. Um, and we find, you know, oftentimes we'll measure uh, through urine specific gravity of the hydration status of, of our athletes, we, we, we'll, we'll measure it on Tuesday. We call it Tinkle Tuesdays. And so, um, you know, as, as athletes come in, they think they're hydrating well, but then they're just, they don't really think about it and they tend to be dehydrated. So I think awareness of your hydration status is, uh, is important. But um, you're generally saving, you know, the Institute of Medicine recommends that you have, you know, women have 2.7 liters of, of naturally occurring, I like to say, non-caloric beverages. Uh, throughout the day, and, and men is about 3.7. 
Um, that's what they're recommending. We've always recommended a half an ounce to an ounce per pound per day. Um, so somewhere within whatever that range is, uh, is is important. But we find most people have no idea how much how much fluid they actually drink per day. So becoming aware um, is good for that foundational standpoint. As it relates to hydration and performance, um, it is about you know getting uh, getting the fluid into the cell and then also you know providing things that have been lost in the sweat. So um, that that's where you start to kind of start to play around with this concept of electrolytes and with sodium being you know one of those main um, electrolyte components as it relates to activity. So you know as we're sweating we're, we're losing um, electrolytes specifically sodium and then you know water follows solute. So sodium you know is a bit of a solute so if you have sodium there it will follow it into the cell. So um, there's some combinations there that are important. So you know if you're a salty sweater, if you are going out for you know really intense um, you know, training session, you will benefit from um, electrolytes and you will benefit from some sodium in there. And uh, traditionally, in traditional uh, sports drinks, you have about 110 milligrams of sodium per eight ounces. And that, that tends to not be enough to really make a difference. So we recommend people look for um, electrolyte replacement beverages as it relates to performance and activity that are providing anywhere between 200 to 240 milligrams of sodium per eight ounces to really maximize that hydration and rehydration um, as it relates to, to activity and performance. Mm, so key. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we're just we can all really be missing it, especially to understand when you start to understand why you need that hydration is also a factor of so many of our nutrients are water soluble and so they're just not going to get where they need to go or, or be useful. Um, so I think it's that really is about uh, you know very clearly understanding it at the cellular level. So that makes great sense. So I want to pivot for a second to this concept of cheat days, cheat foods, the things that everybody thinks they have to give up on, caffeine, alcohol, sugar. Um, let's talk a little bit about that in terms of, uh, I'm not a big believer in cheat days. I'm actually really not a big believer in guilt around your consumption. Um, and But at the same time, uh, I think it is fair to understand that depending on what your game day looks like uh, and what your, as we talked about before, how you define your results um, that you're seeking, there, there might need to be some cutbacks or cutouts on that part. So how, how do those play in and, and how do you help people um, uh, combat the, the feelings of maybe deprivation? Uh, great. It's a great question, and it's um, and it's a complex one. So I think you know I'll start with our perspective, and then you know give some some direct thoughts around um, around actions. But you know at Exos we've had a variety over the past 13 years. You know different ways to to frame up nutrition, different ways to think about kind of our nutrition principles, and we we evolved them last year, and we have five. And um, the five are eat with purpose fuel for impact, aim to sustain, devour life, and make it about you. So when we think about you know, all parts of nutrition, it is about kind of the mechanics and the physiology and the science of fueling the body, but you're also fueling the soul. And there are, there are important social components of eating and you know, traditional types of, of foods that, that might not be um, the most perfect fuel to optimize performance. And that's okay. So um, I think it's coming back to um, you know the beginning and what we talked about. What are you aiming to do? You know, what are your goals? You know, what are the results that you're looking for? And if you are a an extremely hyper focused, high performing athlete, or you know someone who an, an executive who is going through a phase of of needing to have sustainable high performance, then just like a high performance vehicle you should be putting high performance fuel in. And if you don't have those high performance nutrition strategies for your performance will suffer, you know, a little bit. If you are just, you know, kind of going and, and living life and finding, you know, some joy, then then there's there, then there's places for that. So I too am in the camp. We shouldn't feel guilty. Um, there's a lot of foods in the world. There's a lot of reasons to eat. There are a lot of wonderful social interactions that come. Um, and you know, we've always said kind of 80-20, 
as it relates to you know fueling your body to, to perform optimally and then you know twenty percent for enjoying um, you know things that that might not be um, the best the best uh, fuel for that performance but but that's for you know everybody to kind of come up with with that blend that's right for them but it is around you know increasing your overall productivity and and helping you to be the best version of yourself and if you're feeling guilty all the time um, and then maybe maybe that ratio is not quite right so I think it's an ebb and a flow there's not a direct answer there um, but there's a place for for things and there's a place for everything but that ratio of kind of great fuel versus fun fuel um, should be targeted to, to what you're looking to achieve and that's going to ebb and flow throughout the phases of life. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, so I want to start with the last question because I think it's going to actually answer um, the fourth question. This idea of, you know, with different sports, are there different diets? And I think we get a question a lot about, you know, um, are you, do you believe that, you know, vegan or paleo or alkaline? I got a lot of these independent questions and so I was like, is there an exos diet, um, you know, that and I think you've answered a lot of that as we've, got, we've gone along. And so where, I, where I'm really curious is to think about um, how you, in the assessment process, how you match someone's nutritional needs to their particular sport, their particular type of sport. Sure. Um, so I'll start with the, the different types of, of diets and, you know, is there an exos way? And, I, you know, I love seeing the different kind of consistent patterns or diets that, that people put out and I think we've learned a lot from from all of them from you know the vegan standpoint incorporating more vegetables and grains from the paleo standpoint maybe we need to think about um, the overall consumption of carbohydrate and how much do we really need you know there's components of of you know creating an alkaline environment in the in the in the body and then you know this whole kind of ketogenic explosion you know there's a lot to learn around um, you know our bodies uh, need for fat and um, oftentimes in you know disease situations like cancer um, there are times when when the ketogenic diet fits that particular need that you need to achieve. So I think there are, are elements to, to take from all of them. But you know, um, ultimately, at Exos, we want to understand as much as we can about your goals and your own physiology, food intolerances, deficiencies, you know, even into some of the genetic components. If I know you have a B vitamin SNP that's not going to allow you to absorb certain types of B vitamins, we have to we have to fill that gap. So um, you know, just as if I know you're a fast caffeine metabolizer versus a slow, I can change um, or make recommendations for you to change the amount of caffeine that you might have pre-workout or pre-game. So um, I think at the heart of what we do is is trying to personalize with as much or as little information as we can. Um, and as it relates to the different sports or, or different diets. It is, I think about, and I think we all think about it at Exos, less about the sport itself because there can be so many differences in just a sport. So it comes down to that individual. So if I think about the difference um, between a, a midfielder and a striker and a goalie, all soccer players, all different types of positions. So when we think about sport, we think about where are they in their training phase? Um, how much you know activity and movement do they have to maintain that they're doing on a daily basis to maintain their their fitness and their function um, to actually play their sport? Then how much you know are they really kind of actively engaging in that sport? And then thinking about needs from there. So at the end of the day, sports nutrition and performance nutrition is how do we properly fuel movement, and then how do we ultimately help the body. Um, optimize the recovery and the repair from that movement. So different sports, different diets, sure, I think of it as different movements, different types of macronutrient blends. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Love it. Okay, so recovery, um, and let's try to jump through these and, and then we'll get into some people's questions. Um, th this could easily be like a three-hour uh, conversation as well, or a three-day one, um, but I, I'm just loving it. So. Um, let's talk a little bit about how do we actually recover better um, and and we you know I mentioned magnesium I talked about detox what are some of the things that you really stress in order to help the body de-stress yeah 
No, so I think it's definitely a combination of those of those things. We're getting ready to publish a paper on our combine athletes. Those are athletes that are going into the NFL draft, and we looked at the nutrient status of these super high performing athletes um, when they came in to see us, and uh, you know we saw a slew of deficiencies from um, uh, vitamin D, magnesium, omega three fatty acids that are that are not optimal. So um, I think you know when it comes to recovery, it is about um, making sure that you know your body is in a, in a proper nutrient status. So um, I think that is that's really important um, as we think about kind of acute ways to help the body recover. Um, making sure that your post-activity nutrition um, is on point, that you are getting the right amount of carbohydrate to to actually match your movement, um, that you're maintaining your hormone levels and, and hormonal balance, specifically cortisol, you know, throughout the day. Uh, and then that you're you know providing your body with the right nutrients to sleep, and there are some there are some real direct nutrients that that can help with that. So you talked about magnesium. Um, we did a study on a on a on a ingredient called relora. Um, there are other adaptogens like rhodiola, cordyceps, um, and then there's you know some additional components like 5-HTP and melatonin. Um, these all kind of start to come into play with the help of an expert, um, really understanding your situation to maximize your own body's recovery. So, you know, that's how we really look at, at sleep. Um, I think for, you know, is there a cleanse or a detox that, that we recommend? Uh, we don't have an acute cleanse or, um, or detox, but, you know, we need to clean things up. And I think there's two ways, you know, from a nutrition standpoint to clean it up. You have the quality of the food that you're, that you're taking in, um, and then you have an understanding. I think there's still a lot to be said around, around different types of, of food intolerances and removing those foods that are causing inflammation uh, in the body. And then, depending upon what's happening, you know, helping to support uh, the liver with you know things like N-acetylcysteine um, and uh, some other components that that help to support the body's macro system um, to deal with the environmental and physical stress that we put it under on a daily basis. I think that's great. I was just quoting you. I'm like, I love that. We don't have a cleanse or a detox, but we need to clean things up, which I think is just, that is, it's so where we are. I mean, it's it's the one area that we can control for it, right, where we can we can try to support other people who hopefully through their policies and, and businesses are, are trying to be less dirty in, in terms of what they do to the environment. But for us, we can clean things. The control we have is, you know, certainly with our food, um, and supplement. So th I think that's key. So let's wrap here with um, some of the myth, myth busting. You know, just some of the things that I think are keeping people from moving forward from an action standpoint. Um, you know, the, the belief, when people ask, does muscle weigh more than fat, I know that they're really asking, why isn't the scale where it, 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 why isn't it moving or where I think it should be going? So let's talk a little bit about that part and, and what you've seen from uh, whether it's your your athlete or military or you know really anyone that you've worked with, how important is the number on the scale versus say like lean body mass and and some of the other pieces? I think you know those numbers on the scale or the numbers on the caliper or the numbers in the DEXA, you know measuring your your body composition, they're just numbers. They're they're markers. They they don't always correlate to how you feel. So I like to kind of. You know, as a scientist and as a practitioner, those markers are helpful for me to make some adjustments. But what I encourage people to do is is hone in on how they feel. Are you feeling stronger? Are you waking up with more energy? Do you have the energy to physically and mentally get through your day? Are you falling asleep easily? You know, those are the the byproducts of um, you know great uh, mindset, nutrition, movement, recovery strategies. So um, the marker on the scale is just an outside representation of that, but the most important piece is, is how you feel um, throughout your day. So um, my recommendation is, is to focus all on that. Great. And then um, how about from, so I think chocolate's an acceptable food group at any time, I will just add, especially because of the magnesium content, if it's good chocolate. Um, but how do you feel about um, adjusting your eating throughout your cycle? Um, and basically, let's pull it back even one more step. What is the role of navigating uh, hormones, uh, especially for women, um, through uh, at the, um, uh, you know, sort of as you go up the scale from a performance standpoint? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, I think the, the first piece is, is just understanding that your hormones are changing. And so at different points in the cycle, 
um, your body is different. Your cortisol levels start to go up, your serotonin levels start to drop, and when you have those changes in hormones, your, your body responds in different ways. So, um, you know, craving fat or craving sugar, um, those are response to, to what's happening on the inside. So, you know, that's where I think being aware, first and foremost, is important. And then thinking about how much that kind of like, you know, strays you off of, of what is your nutrition normal. So some things I think that you can think about on a more macro standpoint are, again, making sure that, you know, your nutrient status is, is good, that you, you know, your magnesium daily and your vitamin D status is, is right and your B vitamin levels are optimal, all through great functional nutrition. Um, but then, you know, as you get into these certain times, you know, paying a little bit more attention to, um, you know, trying to mediate that increase in cortisol. So, you know, there are some adaptogens that play a role there, uh, but also, you know, meal timing and, um, you know, trying to keep yourself in balance may help to decrease some of that, some of those cravings. But at the end of the day, the hormones are different. You're going to feel different. So get in touch with how you feel and how your actions um, you know, really relate to, to those feelings. Yeah, so key. So you mentioned something in there from a functional standpoint. And so let's come to a conclusion on this. I will totally lead here, and especially in the next resource page, we'll talk about supplements. But um, and I, I started off with some of them. But um, what's your when you talk to people about uh, the role of supplements um, and why you might be integrating them? What what? How do you have that conversation? What's the role of supplements? Do you see? We, well, it goes back to our principles, and we, you know, really talk about supplements under the principle of um, fuel for impact, and we have a sub-principle that's fill the gaps. So there is no doubt that we have to eat well, and that supplements are not magic theory dust that can come in and fix a completely off-kilter um, uh, nutritional plan. And so I think, you know, we have to fuel for, for impact, we have to fuel our bodies for the energy, and, you know, we have to try... Um, to, to get as many nutrient-dense foods as we can. With that said, I think it's challenging to, to do that all the time and to hit levels that, that our bodies um, need to, to function at an optimal level. So um, I think there absolutely is a role for high-quality supplements, but there 100% is a role for us to understand understand our bodies. And, um, you know, we are getting more access to, uh, to different types of, of tests and, and blood work uh, where we can take a look at that, where we're moving beyond, you know, like weight and body comp and moving on beyond just like triglycerides and cholesterol, these markers of health status and into the, the right now, what is my nutrient status and how can I improve that to improve the overall function of my body, not necessarily related to disease markers. So, um, you know, where we find supplements to play a role is to helping to fill that gap mind that gap maybe faster than you can do with food and then periodically you know through the year or you know through your three five years measuring that nutrient status to see where adjustments need to be made great and you know I think one of the things for me is just it really does come back to the definition I mean it, it, they're called supplements it's supplemental nutrition it has to be supplemental to that quality diet and I think that as you talked about before with the software example you know if you're uh, the operating system is is going to be important, but the software is going to play a key role. So I think it's part of the software. So that's great. Um, so just to whet everybody's appetite, wherever you are, it's probably getting close to a nutrition pit stop of some sort. Um, you know, many of the foods and, and ways to get in the nutrients that we talked about today, um, we have tons of recipes on the website. Uh, developed by a bunch of really uh, great people. I have developed a couple, but most of them are from others. Um, and you know, the key thing for for all of us here is we, this prescription only works if it's delicious. So you know, in closing, really thinking about better sports nutrition better be delicious. Um, now my appetite is going, and I wanted to point out that. Um, Thorn and Exos have collaborated. I really love their multivitamin, multimineral. Um, and, you know, one of the key things that I talked a lot about and I always talk a lot about is the role of digestion and detoxification. So you'll see that here. I mentioned Calm. Um, mentioned, you know, the, the role of a healthy digestive system. The, the USDA Organic and NSF are great logos to look for as you assess the quality of your supplements as well as the quality of your food. Um, these coffees and teas have the true Brock in them. 
I uh, can't say enough about hemp, uh, especially in order to get not just the leucine in, but the, the complete uh, protein. I think that's going to be fantastic um, as an addition for you. And these are some fun new products that have great flavors and, and can add spices as well as hemp to, to your meals. And then this was fun. Um, I included this, uh, Amanda, because uh, one of my favorites, um, Tim Ferriss, uh, was in the same article, uh, that, or, sorry, in the same magazine uh, um, I was just going to say episode issue that you guys were featured in in my brain. I was out in LA and now everything's TV. Um, uh, same issue of Outside Magazine, and he really talked about Goat's Way. Um, that's one that w with um, a lot of the uh, Olympic athletes that I've um, either you know been asked to consult with or who have talked to me a little bit about their nutrition in the past. Um, they they really have a preference for goat and sheep milk um, as opposed to cow's milk. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with the quality of the cow's milk also. But I was curious, do you guys use Goat's Whey in your, um, is that a recommend a recommendation of one of the proteins that, that you guys um, will incorporate? We haven't specifically, but it, it definitely gets into our, our mantra around variety. And, you know, variety, I see different types of proteins up here. There's different types of ways. There's different types of carbs, and there's different types of fats. And, and we should be rotating those. And I, yeah. I think that is a fantastic one to add into your rotation. Yeah, and I actually love that one in particular um, uh, for uh, um, childhood and teen um, athletes who might also be having some growing digestive pains like in that way and I think that that makes a big difference so um, Matt I'm gonna turn it back over to you I know we had a couple of questions that had come in uh, and a couple that I had uh, left for this phase in case we didn't get to answer them and just a reminder to everyone too that uh, next month we're going to have a great time it's a great follow to this because it really is that um, better keeping uh, all of your nutrition delicious um, but also really how we can keep all of our, our performance on track uh, through the holidays. So we'll, we'll have a dear friend of mine, Tess Masters, joining us in November. So Matt, what do you have for, for us? Yes, uh, we have a few questions um, just because of time um, and obviously you have both covered a lot and I think maybe even answered some of these questions. Um, but let me ask this one uh, for both you, Ashley and Amanda. How do you know what supplements you need and how much or often to take them? Great. Amanda, what are your thoughts? So um, there's twofold. There's you know, some foundational things in, in looking at kind of your overall diet and, and assessing kind of how you think you're doing. Like if you have clear things that you don't eat, like if you don't eat salmon and you don't eat tuna and you don't eat walnuts, you're not getting very much omega-3. You should think about you know adding adding an omega three supplement back. So I think looking doing a, you know a very objective look at, at your fueling intake uh, is an important first step. But as I said, I you know I am passionate about really knowing your numbers and making it about you. So um, you know having nutrient testing done, have fatty acid testing done. Um, the more we know, um, then the better we can recommend. And to the point of how much and how often. Um, that comes down into you know what types of gaps are we trying to fill. So um, every every supplement and every kind of component is different based on your unique needs, and then can be even fine tuned by um, how we how much we know about the gap we're trying to fill. Yeah, and and I think that's great. We're so on the not surprisingly so on the same page. I would add a couple of things, which is that. This is an area that most physicians um, are not uh, as well versed in. And so one of the things, but I do find more and more, this is a great place for dietitians uh, to, so I do recommend working with someone like us. Um, I have a on, on my site an, uh, a, a very simple, it's just about five or six questions uh, that look at what Amanda talked about, which is what are you doing from a food standpoint? The other thing is when you are choosing your supplements, they need to be at least as good quality as what I'll call your better diet. So your, if your nutritional goals are to eat, you know, try to have more organic and try to avoid artificial ingredients, you want to have that same, set those same standards for your supplements. But the other one that's going to be really important is to look at um, not just what you are taking in, uh, sorry, what you're excluding, um, as well as what you are taking in, but also your medications. And so that's where, you know, we come in in terms of, yes, we want to know what your lab values say, but also what, what treatment plan are you on with your practitioner because some of the medications actually may create what I'll call more conditional deficiencies, things that won't show up on blood work, but things that may um, 
uh, that we know over time can sort of cause you to have less uh, absorption or less um, uh, creation of some of the nutrients. Great example is if you're taking a statin, I'm usually recommending, I'm always recommending a coenzyme Q10. Uh, you know, if you're taking birth control, I'm going to be re looking really hard at your consumption of foods that have B vitamins and, and likely going to recommend a, a B vitamin supplement. So I think you're, um, some of the things that we're taking uh, as medications or even over the counters like fiber supplements um, can uh, have a, a very strong impact on not just what supplements you take but how much and how often and really when during the day and that can sound very daunting um, but it is actually as simple as you know I have five or six questions that you can answer and then I have a separate one I, I was telling you guys I love magnesium I have a separate one to really look at your magnesium and your calcium intake because one of the things I think that one of the reasons dietitians are uniquely um, able to have the conversations around supplements is it's not about your supplements. It's about getting your total nutrition where we want it to be. And we're the ones that are going to look at what you're putting in and on your body uh, most often. And if you're eating a lot of calcium, I'm not going to worry about supplemental calcium, but I'm certainly going to worry about supplemental magnesium if your 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 food intake is not as high. And, and we could flip that conversation as well. So um, check out the evaluation. And I think uh, I would start with what Amanda said is we, we have to know where we are right now from a nutrition assessment and a health assessment. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, you can find Ashley on Facebook or Twitter, or please uh, go to her website, ashleycoffrd.com, and you can send in questions there. Amanda, thank you very much, and please tune in to our next webinar, November the 15th, Better Holiday Nutrition Simplified, because it's better to be healthy and happy, especially at the holidays. Okay, thank you for joining. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Amanda. And this will be up on Ashley's YouTube channel and Facebook within the next 48 hours if you want to check it out again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>